morning all. Uh, welcome to the latest installment of the LGFP webinar series. Um, I hope you're having a good day. Um, Today we will be talking about effective ways to manage your audit process and um, joining me today for a, a bit of a chat will be Sri Narastimahan, who is the Sector Director from the QAO. Um, however, before we start the, um, the discussion, I'd just like to, on behalf of the LGFP, uh, do an acknowledgement of country. So I recognise that we are hosting this webinar today from the country of the Kabi Kabi people here in Noosa. I also recognise the traditional owners of the countries where you all work and the First Nations people present in this webinar. I pay my respect to all elders past and present and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their cultures and connections to the land and waters of Queensland. Okay, so today we, uh, we're talking about effective ways to manage your audit process. And um, welcome, Shri. How are you? Thank you, Michael. Very good. And yourself? And I'm great. So Shri's kindly given up his valuable time to uh, have a chat to the LGFP today. Um, and before we talk, um, get into some um, grilling of Shri, no, just joking, um, a discussion between myself and Shri. Uh, just a little bit of background to, to why we are talking about the audit process today and how we can manage that process, the, how we can manage it more effectively. So back in November, the LGFP uh, undertook a survey of its member base. So um, the reason for that, we're just seeking information on the experiences that our members had with their audit process from the 2023 audit. Um, the purpose was to gain some feedback from, uh, from members and provide that to the QAO uh, to generate some discussion around um, what potential process improvements or opportunities might be possible coming out of that survey feedback. Because um, obviously we want to create more efficient and effective year-end processes, which helps all of us. Um, so just a little bit of stats, um, as we all love in the local government finance world. So we had a 26% response rate for the survey. So that's about 20 councils, which we feel was a good sample size. Um, and we have um, prepared a, a summary paper, which is on our uh, member library to, for members to, um, to consume that feedback. But today we're going to talk about some of the themes coming out of those um, responses. And Shri, on behalf of the QAO, will be um, you know, chatting to me about those. So, so Shri, um, before we start, um, we saw some general themes coming out of the um, survey responses. Um, but I'd like to start um, just for our audience, just could you explain just how the external audit process works? And I'll give you um, a bit of time to talk to, talk to our guests about that. Thanks, Michael. Um, for those that have you know, worked in the QAO and the capacity and finance function, we typically know auditors don't come once a year. We come multiple times a year. Um, and the reason for that being is our visits are usually short and sharp, two weeks at most, uh, the organisation, of course. Um, and we try and come and audit transactions up until a certain point in time um, because, you know, we have to look at 12 months of the transactions and then your balances at year end. So typically we try and do audit, audits in about three visits, uh, what we call a planning visit, where we come and um, try and update our understanding of the controls of the organization from the year before and the process and systems. Um, uh, then we come and do our interim audit, which is at a more than a halfway point in time in the year where we can come and do some transaction testing, but also test the controls that we identified at the planning stage. And then finally we come post June, um, to come and finish the audit of the financial statements. Now, that can vary for some um, councils. Um, so the councils are remote councils. We generally try and do two trips um, where we can do planning and interim together. Um, but in saying that, what we try and do is we do a lot of pre-work uh, based out of the Brisbane office and then trying to make um, the best use of our time while we're on site. And then we come for a year and visit. But for some of the larger councils, uh, we sometimes do four visits, like Brisbane City Council, which is one of my clients. We do four visits. We do a planning and interim, and then what we do is call a hard close, and then we come and do a final audit. So it, it depends on how big the client is, uh, how, how large the transactions are, uh, which will drive the, the number of visits we do. But in terms of the 
check across the board will definitely include, as I said, understanding the systems and controls, testing your controls, testing your transaction balances. So that's the that's the overall, if I may put it this way. Mm. Thanks, Shri. That uh, and have you found in the last probably five odd years, technologies um, playing a, a a role in being able to get that information more readily and and probably do a bit more offsite type transaction 100%. testing and work. Hundred percent. So we've got a we've got a we've got a like a data dashboard that we use. I know not all councils are on it, but those that councils are on it. It's an expensive process both for councils and us, so we haven't pushed it too hard on all 77 councils to come on board. Um, but what we're trying to do with that is it gives us access to readily available information about all the transactions that have gone through your payroll, your general ledger and everything. So all our sample picking and everything can be done, all our analysis that we do where we look at your, you know, um, transactions this year is as current year, what we call this, you know, uh, comparative analysis and all those things. Generally, we try and do it on um, offsite before we go on to the client. Even for our own Brisbane-based client, we try and do that so that when we're actually on site, we can have more meaningful discussions with the client rather than sit there and prepare audit work papers. Um, so there's there's always a combination of on-site and off-site audit. Um, but we always make sure that on-site audits are those where we, while we're on site, we spend the best amount of time talking to clients, trying to understand the issues. And there's any issues communicating to them earlier um, so that you know it doesn't come as a surprise to them while well, we have gone offside and then we ask them for a thousand documents um, and obviously with you know uh, things like SharePoint online and things like that where we have set up a portal for every client we try and access information through um, for asking clients to provide as much information ahead of time um, so that that whole pre-work can happen before we actually come on site for a Brisbane-based client, it's probably not too difficult because, you know, the proximity to the client is easy. If something missed out, you can always quickly go for a day and come back in. But when the client's located in you know, somewhere like say, far north Queensland or western Queensland, um, it does make it very challenging that we can't miss anything. Um, so that, that pre-work is very important for us when we go do our travel jobs. And we, we might talk a bit more about planning for the audit later because I think it's a bit of a theme that coming out of some of the survey answers, Shri. But uh, but probably just moving on to a, um, a bit of another theme now, and it's probably more around um, resourcing because um, I know that in you know within the LGFP and within the sector in general, we're seeing greater levels of staff turnover, particularly since COVID. Um, we're seeing issues with attracting quality and uh, skilled staff. Um, so I'm assuming that's not no different to the QAO, who are um, you know also a government entity. Um, uh, probably more around how's that ha has has that is that happening, and how how's it impacted on your team and your ability to manage audit timeframes, and have you um, got any strategies to deal with that? Yeah, look, um, QAO is also immune to staffing issues like every organization in the world. Uh, and this is not just council, public sector entities, private sector entities across the globe. They're all experiencing staffing issues. Um, now, it's funny to say this has happened since COVID. I'm not sure we've lost that many people in COVID, but what's happened, we don't know. Um, but yes, staffing is, is, is a big issue. Um, I remember when I joined QA about 10 years ago, we used to recruit once a year. We used to have a massive recruitment period for once a year, and that's it. Now, if you go onto our website, you'll see that this constantly rolls available for people to apply to. So, yes, we are constantly looking for people as our, our colleagues in local government. So it, it is a challenge. Um, where it's possible, we are trying to negotiate. So our audits are spread across the year. So we do audits that have got December year ends where the crunch time is January, February. We do audits that have got June year ends. But if you're not a local government, we do the audits in July, August, and then the local governments come back in September, October. So we try and negotiate times and try and spread the work throughout the year where possible to try and get the best outcome for our clients. Um, so one, one example of that is we used to audit a number of control entities for Brisbane City Council in July and August, um, which was not required to be honest at that at that time of the year. So we, we've spoken to the clients, we tried to negotiate the time and said, look, you guys have time to 30 in October to get your financial statement signed. Is there a reason why we're doing this early? You guys are not ready. Our staff are struggling to get things done. Why what, what don't we go and push it back to, say, late August, early September? 
which will still make you meet your uh, your statutory time frame, and at the same time, it will give us a little bit of breathing space. So trying to spread the workload is how we've managed to do it. But one thing to remember, though, Michael, is that the challenge we have is QAO, like any other audit firm, private sector firms, our job, our jobs are stacked one next to each other, right? So if one falls through, it has a domino effect on the other ones too. Um, a lot of clients have come and told me, oh, you know, I can't wait for the audit to get finished. And I, say, I always tell them, we have one audit a year, over 50 of them. So what I meant by that was, you know, if we go back to back on one after the other to get things done. So as much as we would like to finish a job and then move on to the next, it's always not possible. There'll always be some sort of straggling issues or items that have not been provided or things have not been prepared to the standard it should have and things like that, which generally tries to push the audit out a little bit. So there'll always be some sort of lap over. So you'll constantly see our staff, our staff are catching up on the audit from the previous one or the one that before. And again, it depends on you know, how long it's taken to get things ready. We will drive the audit process. So do you think that to, to probably a takeaway for the audience is that <clears throat> probably being mindful that um, should, you know, the particular council could be having issues with um, their own timeframes at that early early engagement with um, the contract auditor. Um, and, and it's potentially a negotiation of um, and an understanding of, you know, workloads and ability to then, um, you know, Delay if there is a delay, then how to negotiate a, a suitable then reconnection right. point right. to ensure right. the audit can. Yeah. So, so give you an example on that one. So we've seen the last few years there's been, um, you know, na natural disasters that have affected various parts of Queensland, and whenever that happens, you know, councils sort of approach us and say, "Oh, my evaluations aren't going to be ready before 30 June. What are we going to do?" So you know, they've always applied for an extension of the minister, and they renegotiated timeframes, which is great. But why only do that when natural disaster hits, right? As much as we would like to have all councils signed by 30 October, if for some reason you've lost a primary staff or something of that sort in your financing that's going to impede your ability to actually get ready for the audit, don't wait till the audit team's on site and then let us know that, oh, you know, our finance manager left last week and you've not done this. Let us know because your finance manager obviously would have told you, I don't know, four weeks, five weeks, three weeks, whatever time frame that is in advance. Let us know as soon as you know that, you know, you won't be ready for the audit. So things can, we, we know we can try and move things around. There might be another client that might be starting in three weeks, but they might be ready. So, you know, there's a possibility that we could swap uh, the teams to go and do the jobs at different times. So the early it's communicated to us, the easier it is for us to plan and manage how we can negotiate time from across the board as well. That's great. Thanks, Rick. And look, just everyone, apologies. Um, as part of my introduction, I meant to um, um, let you all know that should you have any questions throughout the um, the webinar, there's a live Q&A button um, at the bottom toolbar. So please put your questions through there. Shri and I will get to questions probably at the back end of the um, today's session. So probably last 10 or 15 minutes or so. So um, yes, apologies for that. Um, but we'll keep going now, Shri. Um, so look, the annual audit is, is effectively a project, um, you know, and council and audit, you know, audit staff, they're key stakeholders as part of that, that project. Um, one of the recent, uh, in the recent survey, some of the feedback suggested some communication shortcomings uh, were contributing to some of the delays with the audits and a bit of frustration. Um, just from your view, what improvements do you think could be implemented with, um, if we're talking about projects and stakeholders, um, how could, um, you know, some of those improvements be implemented to improve the process and address some of those uh, issues that have been, um, raised by our uh, survey respondents. So Michael, um, you probably know this and a lot of council staff also probably know this. We do our own survey every year. And you know that's the theme that seems to be coming out of our survey results as well. I think we had about 61 councils that responded. Um, we did it over a long period of time. So you know, we um, we had the opportunity of hearing from, uh, from more councils than you guys did. Um, but yeah, look, communication is key. Uh, it's a it's a two it's a two way street as far as communication is concerned. You know, as I said, 
in you know about a couple of minutes ago we were talking about when things don't when things are not ready communicate at the same way there's an expectation on our behalf that when when things are not going as planned as what we would like to if the client is delivered on everything it's an obligation of the auditors upon the auditors part to communicate as well so and if it's not working if the communication is not working there's always an escalation mechanism right so if, for example if qio ourselves are doing the audit you know <coughs> usually the first word call <coughs> apologies the first um, what call is the manager if the manager is not reachable then it's one of the directors it's either me or another director that works with me um in in qio but then the same applies where our audits are contracted up you know i think about 6 to 5 councils are done by contract auditors it's largely due to the fact that mm. you know queensland is very widely spread state and it's going to be impossible for us to get to every 77 states as qa or so you know 6 to 5 audits get audited by our audit service providers who are professionally qualified reputable firms in queensland and australia and some overseas as well so you know the escalation process works should work there exactly the way it works here so your first port of call is a uh, is the is the contract audit partner if um if things are if things are not going well and you know if you're getting no love from the audit partner then that's when you come to the QAO staff and say hey look you look after us from a QAO perspective i'm having a problem with this particular auditor uh and how do we go about this um so you know there's always a escalation process there's always an escalation mechanism and by all means i would encourage all councils to reach out to QAO and your respective or uh, your respective directors um if things are not working with the contract auditors you know we will we will we will rather hear about it now rather than wait for the audit to finish and there's a bad taste in everyone's mouth and you know you guys are not happy about it so what one of the things michael as i said because we started saying that come to the survey one of the things that i have personally started is having a one on one conversation with my clients and this is not my in house jobs this is my contract about jobs where i catch up with the cfo once a quarter just to try and check in and see how things are going um and if there's any problems that they are that they are facing from an audit perspective or any any other thing that they might need help with or, or guidance or suggestion with so that again you know rather than wait for the end try and see if we can we can we can intervene earlier if there's any issues and three i think in terms of the you know it is a project and if council staff think about you know infrastructure projects and so on there's usually a plan in place so probably a takeaway for our uh, audience is do you have a a project plan you know basic thing elements for a project plan and some of those you'd leave straight out of your audit plan which is negotiated in advance would be the timetable so do you have a timetable within your plan can you align that with what was agreed with um your contract auditors um do you have a list of tasks so a lot of councils have a detailed task list for end of financial year so that's something you know that's what good project plans have a list of actions and tasks with with time frames that then link to what was agreed with with your your contract auditor as part of that um you know um preliminary audit discussion um and probably a couple that I think may be missing which would be important and it touches on what you said Shree is communication plan again a good project plan has a communication plan in place so who are you talking to um who are your stakeholders so um obviously it'll be your your auditors but internally you know there's multiple stakeholders who are involved in the audit process not just the finance people there's probably your you know your executive who mm-hmm. might need to be answering questions definitely probably your infrastructure teams who you know get question on things like valuations and so on even governance in terms of you know some of the governance um components of the audit so um is that communication plan in place um all, also a risk management plan or risk plan and what are some of the key risks of the audit are you aware from the council side of things that you need to manage councils have strategic risk plans even operational risk plans in place can you then you know replicate what you currently do just it could even be five or six key risks you want to manage and it could be you know resourcing could be um a number of different things that will help you manage the audit process from your side as a council you know a finance manager or a CFO or a finance coordinator but then 
you can probably even share that with um, your contract order as well as part of good communication. So, um, and that could even, think, sorry, Shri. Sorry. Yep. I, I think it's a great point you made there, Michael, because if you start breaking up the big tasks into smaller blocks, you know, that's when it'll be, it'll be easy for council to identify if there are certain tasks that won't be done by the time the audit is coming. That'll also be a, 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 an opportunity for you to go and negotiate saying, look, 80% of the information is going to be ready when you come for the visit. There's this 20% that won't be ready. Is there any chance you come back for another two or three days in three weeks' time? Again, you know, breaking that up will help them identify those roadblocks, but also help them that that early communication in terms of where things can not be ready for the auditors. Yeah, okay. and, and possibly just to wrap this question up, Shree, um, and, you know, a bit of a discussion we had at the, at the LGFP committee level. Um, I know that um, a bit of discussion was had around if you do your communication planning properly, you can even be really proactive and start locking out calendar time for some of the key yeah. stakeholders within council. So if you, you know, it's it's hard to get a, a, a manager or a director at the best of times, but if, if that's going to be a requirement of the audit, then, you know, you could be doing this a couple of months in advance, locking in some times, sharing it with the contract auditors so that, you know, when they come on site and they need to have discussions, the time's there, it's blocked out, and it's not then, you know, the reactive chasing, which we all know happens when you're trying to, you know, answer questions or, or have those interviews. So, um, so yeah, I think communication, planning, um, and project management are probably some key things that that need to be, um, you know, probably a bit more rigor placed around that sort of thinking. So, all right, Sri. The next question, um, just as a, again, some survey feedback was around um, that some councils had repeat queries and requests for information during their audits. Um, Again, Shree, what do you think some strategies could be employed by both council staff and audit teams to reduce these repetitive interactions and improve the efficiency of, of audits? Okay. Um, I might just start off explaining how the audit request process works. Um, and I would expect that our audit service providers follow the same process because we all come pretty much from the same pod as auditors. Um, so usually what happens is before the audit starts, and this is at least two weeks prior to the visit starts, um, we expect to send out what we call as an audit request list. Some clients, some some of our firms call it prepared by client list. It's got various different names attached to it, but at the end of the day, all it is is the list of things that the auditors need when they are on site on the day one. Right? <clears throat> We also try and see how we can source it. Again, as I said, whether it's a Brisbane-based client or it's an off or a client that's sitting in far north Queensland or western Queensland, we always try and source it through SharePoint. And the reason for that being is that, you know, we are living in the 21st century. Paper documents are of the thing of the past. Yes, some councils still do paper documents, which is fine. But putting in the SharePoint makes sure that, one, it's made available to the auditors. It's easy to track when it was provided. But also, if something is missing, it's easy to track. With paper documents, things can get lost. You know, things can get buried. So, you know, we try and source it through that. What we typically try and do is, again, this is for more for a job, like a travel job where we're heading out to a client on site, which is away from Brisbane, is we try and give the list much more in advance because that pre-work time, one of the first things we do as a part of the audit pre-work period is, doing a reconciliation of what was asked for and what has been provided. Now, when I say that, what I mean is that, say if you ask for 25 invoices, as an example, we'll see there's 25 invoices that's been loaded. We won't go into each of them and, and see whether that's the invoice that we asked for and that has been provided and it's correct. And that's because that is what we actually do with the whole, when we actually do the actual ticking and tying of the, of the transactions. So. As a part of the pre-work, we do an initial reconciliation of information, and that is done at least a week out before we are supposed to travel. And what that does is it helps us identify things that have been provided and the things that are still outstanding. Again, it goes to the whole communication, Michael, we talked about going back to the client and saying, okay, your product is 80% of the staff, when is the 20% coming? Is there going to be a delay? To try and understand that. So making sure that you get your request list from your auditors at least two weeks before they start is quite is quite important. As Michael said, the excellent audit plan has all the visit dates of the auditors. And if you calendarize that in your diary, saying the auditors are coming out in two weeks' time, if you put a reminder two weeks ahead of them to 
ask them for their request list that puts you in good um, uh, good position to be prepared for the audit. Um, now, there's also a difference that I've seen between what a repeat query and what an incorrect information that's been provided. So what happens is sometimes in the rush of getting things ready for the auditors, council might have inadvertently um, given information that is not relevant or is not what the auditors asked for. So in the auditor, as I said, they, they might have done a stock take, they would have thought everything is ready, go on site, go have a look. Oh, these are the five invoices you gave us of the 25, which was not the ones we asked for. And it could be as simple as some junior person in the council audit might have incorrectly scanned something in or run an incorrect report that might have gone in or might have run a report with not all the parameters that was asked for. So there could be multiple reasons. So it's there's always a distinction between repeat queries and incorrect information or incomplete information that's provided. So it's really important to know that. But in saying that, look, as I said, you know, we all have experienced staffing challenges, right? And, you know, whether due to resignation or We've just might have Shri who's um, frozen for a minute, uh, mid sentence, unfortunately. But um, yeah, look, we'll see if we can get Shri back. Everyone, apologies, apologies for the te technical glitch. Um, but look, maybe what what I'll probably do on this topic as well as jump in a bit. Um, I know that um, a number of councils have some pretty um, robust processes in place around. Um, checklists and queries, um, a checklist of queries and requests. So that's probably where um, are you logging if there are um, repeat queries and requests, are they being logged in a central location? So with technology now, um, um, there are opportunities to share documents and tools. So we know that, you know, as Sri mentioned, there's SharePoint. So can SharePoint be used to um, create a log of outstanding queries and requests, can you then update those as you go, share them with the contract auditor or the QAO so that you're keeping track um, of initial and subsequent requests? And I know that some councils do that quite well and they challenge the, um, you know, they'll often potentially um, refer the contract auditor back to a document that has been provided um, where there might be a repeat request, or as Sri mentioned, there could be a genuine need for that additional information. So, um, and the other one, you know, we're going to keep reinforcing this theme around communication. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, do you have a communication approach where you're regularly touching base with your contract auditors? You know, and as we know, we get those two week windows and then, but it could be multiple times a week, you're touching base multiple times a week um, and you're not leaving it to um, the, the contract order to follow up, but you're actually proactively um, following up on those requests and, and vice versa. So that, you know, again, it's all about timing, getting things done, um, ensuring that the audits um, are signed off within the, the agreed timeframes and that council can um, get a annual report finished and the financial statement signed off and included yeah. in those annual reports as well. So. Tree, you're back. Well done. Yeah, sorry, yeah. something happened and I just I thought I was frozen on the screen. So. It was um I think I was getting a little bit worried that I'd have to talk for another twenty two yeah. minutes, but um luckily for the audience, um that might not be happening, which is great. So um Shree, is there anything probably I did a bit of a wrap up of that question, but is there anything you sort of wanted to to sort of cut off mid mid sentence there? So anything regarding, you know, um I think you were talking about, you know, there is often, you know, you, we do get staff turnover on both sides and that can create challenges with information yeah. and provision and, and um, so on. So um, anything sort of final you wanted to yeah, look, recommend, again, no. recommend to our audience on, um, you know, how do we avoid those repeat requests um, so that, that the audits can be nice and smooth? Yeah. Look, it, it, it um, again, you know, make, making sure that, information is provided on a timely manner, making sure constantly communicating with your audit teams to confirm that they've received all they've got is important. Again, you know, as I said, the audit team consists of many people, 
right? It's not just the junior person on, 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 on the team. There's a manager that's available. So making sure that, you know, you communicate with the manager and, and keep the communication channel open. Sorry, as I was connecting, I think, Michael, you were talking about this constant communication with the auditors, not just while where they are on site, but making sure the communication channel is open throughout the period is quite important. And yeah, and I, and I did mention, Sri, that, you know, use the technology available now because we're in a world where there's, you know, easily, you can easily share um, information, we can share spreadsheets, we can share Word documents, you know, and, and they can be a single source of truth for where things are at, particularly around requests and so on. So encourage members to, if you're not already, then as Sri mentioned, there's, you know, use of SharePoint to store you know, single files that can be a a reference point for both so you know where you're at with um you know any information provision that's that's um outstanding so thank you shri um next question we'll move on to um some of the survey respondents have suggested improvements um well, actually i'll uh, let me i've jumped a question here shri um delays in audit sign off seem to be a common issue as part of the survey responses in your experience what are some of the primary factors contributing to these delays and what measures can be taken to mitigate them in future audits? Yeah, look, there are multiple factors, Michael, as you as you mentioned. But one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons we've seen in the last few years is the staffing issue, um, both at council and QAO side. As, as I mentioned before, you know, when we plan for the audit, like we we book our resourcing out for almost the next twelve months, and when when things go off track, you know, it has got a domino effect, and and you know having that early communication will definitely help mitigate some of those issues where things can be moved and juggled. Um, but, you know, we've acknowledged that councils um, haven't had the best of um, times in terms of, you know, trying to source staff. In our reports to Parliament, we've recognised that and the challenges that councillors, um, the councils have felt as a result of that. Um, but we also, what we felt, Michael, is that we felt that the readiness of the audit seems to have dropped off. And, and what I mean by that was, you know, till about four years ago when we had that whole traffic light um, thing where, you know, we were talking about mm -hmm. trying to bring council sign-off forward and every council was trying to achieve that early sign-off date so that they don't get an amber or, or a red light in the, in, in the closing report and, and the report to parliament. Not saying that's going to come back in. That's definitely not our intention. But what I'm saying is since we've dropped, uh, dropped the traffic lights off, we, we've You've seen that the councils that are getting ready to do the audit, councils that have been signing off in early um, October or mid-October are now pushing to the right to the end. And what happens is when, as I said, for you guys, it's one audit a year. For us, it's multiple audits a year. If we have to sign off, say, 30 sets of financial statements between the 28th and 31st of October, which is what happened the last couple of years, imagine the workload that comes at the very end which then means it will result in delays from our end as well. So making sure, trying to see how we can get things done early, ready, makes makes a lot of difference. Um, in our reports to Parliament for the last couple of years, we've also been identifying reasons for the audit delays. One of the things is not not having good month-end processes. We, we are increasingly seeing that um, being a recurring theme across, account, across the sector, um, can't remember the numbers, but there's about 100 plus uh, issues with month end reporting uh, and year end reporting uh, in the last few years. So, you know, there, there's there's a number of councils that are that are not having those good processes. And, and, and Shri, with that, are we talking like, you know, the balance sheet reconciliations aren't being yeah. completed? Yeah. Um, so you're yeah. getting to the end of the year and then you've got a, a bit of a backlog of you know, right. time that you're going to need to spend on, you know, getting all your balance sheets reconciled, your accounts and um, potentially even capitalisation. I think that's a challenge yeah. for all councils. Yeah. Are you yeah. leaving your capitalisation to year end because you're, um, for whatever reason, resourcing? Some councils just don't do it because evaluation changes, you know, evaluation. Yeah. Train, so, um, and, and that could and be, be a future, future topic we can discuss, um, which is... Because I think assets is a, is always the, the um, probably one of the primary factors of um, you know delays in in audit signals. Right. Yeah, and, and I think Michael, since twenty twenty, when the new standards came in for grants, and we know that a lot of councils in Queensland are heavily reliant on grants, 
you know, when they don't they don't do their contract asset liability calculations on a periodic basis. I'm not saying do it monthly. Monthly would be awesome, but again, taking into account resourcing constraints, even if you do it quarterly, you know, it gets this it, it just makes you more ready for year end. A lot of the times we found that councils there don't do that for the entire year and then they struggle to get things done post 30 June. And it's not just from a financial audit perspective, but also what it meant was if you're a council that are heavily reliant on grant, and if you've been if you're not being accounting for your contract asset and liabilities throughout the period, you're technically providing incorrect information to your councillors. You're telling them that there's more cash available to be spent, when in fact it's not, because a lot of the cash that you receive is for a specific grant. And that needs to be, you know, um kept aside for that specific right, yeah. purpose. So it's restricted yeah. cash. So, you know, it both from a council perspective and from the order perspective, it would be very helpful if councils can do that on a periodic basis. Mm -hmm. Um, we also found a lot of councils don't do landfill provisions. Uh, again, we're not expecting them to do it again every month. Something to consider, maybe do a half yearly check-in on your landfill provisions, see whether your estimates and things are done early, um, you know, whether the assumptions that you've used seems to be appropriate and things like that. And check, and check that with the audit when they're coming for the interim audit, because usually typically an interim audit happens around April, May. Yeah. By the time the best part of the year is done, so you would know what your provision should look like by 30 June. So making sure that checking in with the auditors and trying to see how much work that you can bring forward for your auditors too is going to help. Because as I said, the crunch time is usually September, October. That's when things fall over. During the year, there's always negotiable uh, deadlines that we, we, yeah. we can have. It's only the September, October period becomes pretty much non-negotiable because everybody wants to get on board and have things done by 30 October. So I think takeaways there for me, Shri, are um, just be mindful that um, obviously delays in the order process can compound the, the QAO and their contract order to timeframes and then their ability to to meet them because of um, potentially um, just um, a crush of, of workload coming in at the same time, which um, we're all familiar with uh, being we're talking about being prepared and doing better at planning the audit, um, you know, again, when sourcing information. So, you know, timely provision of information is the key. Keeping, can you keep basics going during the year? So your balance sheet wrecks. Can you do, um, you know, capitalisation on an ongoing basis? I know that that's, you know, there's some of the key challenges, but there, you know, we have to be prepared to, um, to try and meet those challenges. And again, I think it's that general project and good project management um, seems to be the common theme. You know, can we, you know, manage this as a project and 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 put in place the the disciplines we need to um, to manage risk as well. So having a risk plan, you know, and and that could, you know, again start to mitigate some of some of those sign off issues, um, Shri. So. All right, I'll get to the question I was going to ask um, just before Shree. So some of the survey respondents have suggested improvements such as having a dedicated local government experts within the um, audit teams and consistency within the audit team during the audit. Um, and I'm noting we talked about resource issues just before Shree, but how feasible do you think some of these suggestions are regarding um, dedicated local government experts uh, consistent team membership. Um, so, are they feasible, and what steps might be taken to um, implement those type of recommendations? Look, um, consistency is something that's in no one's control. I'll be honest. Um, just as your workforce is fluid, so is ours and IS base. We are seeing churn across the board, like you guys are. But where, where possible, we do try and maintain continuity. Um, in, in terms of having dedicated LG-centric uh, people on jobs, our managers and directors are definitely uh, LG experts. Um, we structure the, the QAO way of doing things in such a way that, you know, our managers and directors have sufficient expertise in local government when they get on put onto a job. And I'm guessing our ASPs do the same as well. Um, and I do believe our ASPs do the same because I've worked with, you know, about four or five different firms, maybe more, where when I talk to those partners and managers, I can I, I know what they're talking about from a local government perspective. Um, 
We don't operate in a silo model though. We used to do that many years ago, but we moved away from that. And that is so that we could give our staff a breadth of experience across different industries. But as I said, we do try and keep our expertise within the managing director who are primarily responsible for the delivery or the audit anyway. So that's one thing. Uh, in terms of how we try and keep our junior staff um, in, in terms of you know knowledge-wise, in terms of what they need to know before they get on site, we have started providing a lot of LD specific training. Um, um, this about three weeks ago, we um, we did a training for all the new entrants into the local government space, where we talked about what are the fundamentals of um, um, the um, local government um, audits. Um, we talked about things like how do you audit rates, how do you audit Trojan for landfill, um, how do you audit infrastructure charges. Uh, it was a it was a long training session. What we're now trying to do is we are trying to now break them into smaller components and try and we've we been doing more targeted training on a specific topic or a like walk session or something. But that is something that we've already thought about and that's going to be in the pipeline over the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, thanks, Shree. And I think um, yeah, it's just to probably um, just to uh, follow on from what you've just said. Um, yeah, in, in recent discussions we've had, um, you you have sort of mentioned to the LGFP that you are doing some specific LG overview sessions for your contract auditors, and you'll be doing doing more training in this calendar year. And probably for our members, um, you know, the LGFP is, is offered to um, support Tree and the team in terms of uh, any any um, advice or um, education we can also help provide in yeah. that space. So um, watch yeah. watch, uh, watch that space, Shri, I think, yeah. isn't it? So, and I think it could be a good initiative and obviously um, it's it's something that will benefit not only not only the sector, the local government sector, but also the, you know, knowledge and experience within within the audit teams themselves. So, yeah, right Michael, what, Sorry, one other thing I'd just like yes. to add is that as much as, you know, like a turnover in the profession um, has probably had an impact on impact on retention of knowledge from our end, but we also we also seeing that the council and where you know when when a finance person leaves after being there for four or five or ten years and then a new person comes on board, there's also learning. So, you know, mm. it, it's probably happening on both sides to an extent. Both sides, of course, yeah, and that's um, you know again. Succession risk is a big challenge for local government as well, particularly in some of those key positions like rates is probably an area where, you know, there's some yep. pretty specific knowledge. So how do we, um, as a as a sector, manage some of that risk where, you know, people that have been in those roles for 20, 30 years are starting to retire and, yep. and we're needing to then replace them with um, yep. similar levels of experience. So yep. yes, ongoing challenge, of course. Um, Right, Shree, next question. Um, so considering that 75% of councils who responded to the survey prepare their financial statements in-house, what better practices have you seen applied for balancing internal preparation with external support to ensure accuracy and efficiency? Yep. Um, so many councils rely on valuation. That's one of the biggest things that they try and get external support from. Um, try and see how we can bring this forward. Um, I do appreciate that we are in a state where natural disasters is uh, is quite prevalent, is quite widespread. So getting valuations done in some parts of the state very early might not be a very fruitful exercise. But again, try and see how we can still bring forward any any other work in in that instance. But again, don't don't wait till thirty June to go and engage a valuer. Uh, last year we know for a council that did everything right but they forgot to engage the value because there was change in the CEO, there was a change in the CFO, mm -hmm. and then suddenly they realized, oh, the orders are coming in three weeks' time, we don't have a valuer, which then resulted in them not being able to find one. Eventually, they got one, the valuer couldn't make it on site. So, you know, it completely delayed their audit process by many, many, many months. So, you know, trying to see if you can bring forward valuation, that would be, that'd be great. Again, as Michael, I think you pointed out that, you know, Audit is not just about the finance team. There are many other teams that are involved. There's an engineering team. There's an asset management team. There's a payroll team. You know, there are so many other parts of council, depending on how big you are. There could be a town planning team that could be involved in the audit process when it comes to infrastructure charges. While they're not external to the organization, they're still external to the finance team. Mm. And the finance team is reliant on the other teams to provide them the information to complete the set of financial statements and be ready for the audit. So, again, trying to get early 
with them in trying to get information early from them is quite important in making sure that um, you know the financial statements are prepared prepared to a decent quality and provided to the auditors in a, in a way. Um, one of the most important external person that they'll be dealing with in the audit process are the auditors themselves. You know, um, liaising with the auditors as early as possible, specifically on you know if you've got a specific accounting issue that you're not sure about, don't again don't wait for the auditors to come on site after 30 June and then tell them you've got the problem. Once you know, pick up the phone, call them, send them a quick email um, and let them know this is in. We talked about the audit request list, making sure that is that is received well in advance. Um, the auditors haven't sent it to you, um, send them an email and ask them, you're coming on site in two weeks time, where's your audit request list? Um, again, as I said, you know, there's delays at Council send, don't wait for the auditors to turn up on site and let them know things are not going as planned. Let them know well in advance. Because mind you, some of the travels to some of these locations is a challenge um, for us and our ASPs. Um, so, you know, it's not easy to cancel our flights and book him. Suddenly at the last minute, that, ha that has happened to me on a couple of times on a couple of my audits. And it, it, what that does is it, if, if travel becomes impossible, then the audit can't happen, you know, until the next time we can visit. So, you know, it puts a lot of challenge on us. So making sure that um, those communication lines are open is, 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 is very essential. So it's basically, again, stakeholder management, as I mentioned earlier, maybe, you know, have you got that in your planning, um, identifying those stakeholders early and, um, you know, engaging with them and locking them down for um, the information you need and also potentially for, you know, discussions and the meetings for the on-site audit visits. Um, you're also seeing, Shree, just quickly, um, I suppose from an external point of view, councils using their own sort of, or using third party sort of software tools for preparing their financial statements. I think that's fairly prevalent now in the industry. Yeah, like LG Solutions is one that comes to mind straight away where, they, where a lot of councils use LG Solutions. Again, you know, um, when, when once the once the template financial statements are ready, usually on February, March, trying to getting your performance done, speaking to LG Solutions or any other third party that you're using to prepare financial statements, um, and having all those disclosures done early uh, to the extent that you can you can do them uh, is also quite important in um, in that whole readiness of being um, ready for the audit. Mm, for sure. Um, so just a reminder to everyone, any questions? I know we've seen a few questions coming through, which we'll get to shortly, but we'll probably spend another five minutes or so just uh, having a chat with Shri just on a couple of other matters. But Shri, um, one council or one survey respondent that saw um, reported changes to the financial statements after review by their audit committee. Um, so I suppose in your view, how critical is the role of the audit committee in the audit process? Uh, and how might the, their impact be enhanced? I think, Michael, everybody that, that knows me probably knows me how many times I've harped out about not having an audit committee in councils. So they're probably sick of hearing that. But in reality, the you know, an audit committee provides invaluable level of advice to councils, and that is uh, that should come as no surprise to anyone. Look, I think we still have about 16 councils or so, Michael, that don't have an audit committee. Um, not not legislatively required, but in saying that not not many councils that need an audit committee have still established one. And this is uh, them showing their commitment towards good governance um, uh, for the organization. Uh, look, an audit committee is it's an external advisory uh, body that just provides uh, additional level of um, comfort to your mayors and CEOs before they sign a set of financial statements. Now, in this one council where you said that uh, they have provided the financial statement, there was only one change. The council has done an exceptionally good job because if the audit committee is not making too many changes, that means the finance team is, um, should be proud of themselves in terms of the quality of work that they produce. Um, so just because an audit committee doesn't pick up changes in your financial statement doesn't mean that they're any less valuable. Um, their role is not to be a, a quality assurance of the council's processes, but to be an independent advisor to uh, the mayor and the CEO and the council in general on um, things like external audit, internal audit, risk management. Um, as I said, it, it you know a lot of mayors and CEOs um, they're not finance professional. Uh, you know they they have their own field of expertise. 
but they are the ones that actually sign the financial statements of the council and they are, they take mm. um you know it, it's it's their name that's put on the, on, on on the line when, when, when it comes to signing the financial so you know having that audit committee review the set of financial statements and providing the mayor and the, and the, and the ceo the comfort that it's been through a set of experts who understand this is is quite invaluable um but also remember the audit committee you know they they get involved in the audit process throughout the throughout the audit process they get involved in the planning where they look at our audit plan where they look at the audit strategy you know uh, i've sat in audit committees where they grill me on why you're looking at certain things why you're not looking at certain things and again this is quite invaluable because they understand the council's operation but they also understand from an audit perspective what is required so you know trying to uh, trying to use your audit committee as much as possible this is, is, is a very very useful uh, mechanism of making sure that your mayor and CEO are comfortable at the end of the day when they have to sign the financial statements. Yeah, good, good point, Shree. Thank you. Look, we've got a couple more questions, Shree, but I think we've also got quite a few uh, questions from our audience. And noting that we've got nine minutes and 28 seconds left before we get kicked out of the uh, webinar, we might go to some questions first. And if we get time at the end, we'll probably come back to a couple of our our um, pre-prepared questions. Um, first question is um, oh, from Shri, uh, from Jess Rosso saying, quick thanks for being available and open for the chat. I think it's great to see a commitment to improving communication between audit teams and finance staff. So thank you very much, Jess. Um, always good to get a um, some good, uh, good feedback, Shri. Um, so the next question, Shri, um, what training is provided, and maybe we've answered this question, but what training is provided to the QAO and contract auditors explaining how council rates and charges work? Uh, this is an area that auditors seem to struggle to understand, or, or me, I'll, yeah. me included, and I'm not an auditor, and what and um, want to treat the same as, understand and want to treat the same as sundry debtors. So I suppose, yeah, that's, um, you know, the, you know, the rates and charges, the dark arts of rates and charges and how um, contract auditors um, are educated around that. Yeah. And, and as I said, you know, we started providing the sector-based uh, sector training um, in the last three or four months. So that should probably help with some of the basic understanding. Um, and again, as I said, we are committed to providing more targeted training on certain specific questions, so a specific area um, that orders are struggling with and that's something that we will be doing over the next six to 12 months in terms of uh, large box sessions and things like that. Mm. Yep, excellent. And as I mentioned, the LGFP are keen to sort of help out where we can in that space as well. So uh, next question, Shri, if the auditors could pro provide a request list before end of financial year, relevant reports, working documents could be collected in real time. Is there a reason why the request list is only provided at least two weeks prior to the audit visit? Um, no, there's, there's no reason there's, I mean, there's, 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 there's no reason it has to be two weeks prior. It could be longer. Um, the reason why we wait for two weeks is that way then, you know, we have all the transactions for the period that we are looking to audit. So samples can be picked. Um, look for some of my clients, what we try and do is we have a running request list where there'll be standard reports every year for every different phases of the audit that we need. And, you know, we, we provide them. Um, but then we then send out specific samples two weeks before. So, you know, again, there's no hard and fast rule that this is how um, audit request list should work. Um, you know, if if you think that there's a better way of doing it, by all means, come and speak to us or come and speak to your contract audit and let them know this is how we prefer to get the audit request list and this is how we prefer to provide the information. And, you know, if that's going to make audit life easy for you and, the audit, and, and for the auditor, I don't, I don't see a reason why not. Excellent. So again, you're allowed to um, you're allowed to go back to your auditor. You're allowed to um, you know negotiate. I think that's you know negotiations the key, Shri. Um, next question: Our council has an internal audit program with key focus areas that are that is delivered each year. Outside outside of this, we also use our internal audit firm for some high level accounting assistance at year end to prepare solid position papers for our QAO contract auditors. Does QAO perceive this as a conflict? So effectively using um, um, accounting firms to help with internal audit and also prepare or assist with financial statement preparation. Um, look, ideally internal auditors are meant to provide internal audit services. It's a very unique skill set. Um, 
it adds a different dimension to the governance structure of an organization. They provide independent, unbiased um, advice on a number of things. Um, I understand that um, there are some firms, uh, sorry, there are some councils, again, resourcing challenges or, you know, not being able to identify the high, the right level of qualified person to undertake some of these things will need um, some support from certain firms to undertake uh, what we call as extension of management accounting services or extension of what management does. Um, look, it's not really a conflict as such as I see um, where, where it can be awarded. It'll be great if it can be awarded, but again, end of the day, understand the resourcing challenges that we do have in the sector and you know um if if that's how things need to be done we are okay with that yep and I suppose, but, but don't use um, but don't use your internal exclusively just for that purpose you know correct. it yeah. can be a part of their plan but it can't be the entire plan mm. and look i suppose it's um you know council has to manage that and um you know they have their own procurement processes around um that they would need to abide by in terms of, you know, uh, engaging engaging contractors to do work. So, um, so probably um, a couple more, Sri. We've got four minutes, seventeen seconds left. Uh, what is your advice for councils that are having difficulty with preparation, or, or during an audit, issues or concerns arise? Uh, um, we probably just possibly answered this, have we? Or <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, early engagement, is, yeah, yeah, early engagement, communication, um, renegotiating times well in ahead of the audit visit. Um, those sorts of things will, will definitely help. Um, and probably from, um, you know, uh, from the LGFP's point of view, reach out to us as well. You know, we're, you know, come through your um, networks if, um, particularly on specific issues, because we're all doing the same thing. There might be an opportunity for, for a fellow member to provide advice or even potentially if it's something like a position paper or something, you know, more than I'm sure people are happy to, to share. And we've seen that on a number of times. So again, communicate with your, your auditors. Um, have you got your planning in place and uh, reach out through your networks? Yeah. Um, Shri, question, what is your top tip heading into this year's audit season? What councils can do, that councils can do, I should say. Yeah. Um, well, I talk about a number of things. Michael, I think I think the most important thing, given that last year was a big concern, um, try and increase your communication channels with the auditors. Um, make it uh, make make it a make it a constant communication channel rather than just having it before and after the audit period. Um, but also being prepared um, when things are not going well. Again, um, communicate when when things are not going well with us. Escalate. Um, that will help resolve a lot of those issues in a timely, in an early uh, manner, rather than wait till right, right till the end. Yeah. So again, take away everyone. Don't just put your head in the sand if there's issues. You you know yeah. get, get in yeah. front of them. Get in front of your issues. Yeah. Communicate. Um, you know the. QIA were there to help. We're here to get good outcomes for the sector. It's not about, um, you know, there's no blame. Things happen. That's the reality. So, um, Shri, we've got a couple of minutes to go. Um, just a couple more quick questions. It seems to be a large increase in the volume of order requests that come through in recent years. Can you advise, advise of any changes or reasons for this? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, that, that a difficult one to answer. <laughs> Yeah, in, in a sense, it, basis. It, it depends on what large increases in volume order request means to the Michael. So, for example, um, you know, one of the things we do from our audit side, as I said, we, we come and test controls, and if the controls are working fine, that we may not have to do less substantive audit, which is the ticking and tying. But if the controls have failed, that means you have to do more substantive testing, which means there's more ticking and tying. So, more samples. Mm -hmm. more invoices, more documentation. So it, it depends. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very broad question. There could be multiple answers for that. So but that could be one thing. That's the reason why the number of audit requests are increasing. The one change that did happen in the last 12 months or so is the IT audit. The focus on IT audit mm -hmm. has increased, and that's because of a change in the auditing standards. Uh, yep. or actually, it's more of a clarification to the auditing standard that came through that resulted in that. But other than that, our auditing standards haven't really changed much. There has been new accounting standards that have come through. So we, we know about the leases, we yeah. know about this new um, uh, grant 
So obviously, previously the grant money comes in, money gets recognized. It was very simple to audit, but not anymore. You know, especially if it's a capital grant, there's there's thousand things the council would have to get ready for and prepare before we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, three. <clears throat> I suppose also would just a quick clarification would councils with outstanding audit matters would that also uh, potentially contribute to additional 100%. requests yeah 100 yeah. percent. because the more the audit issues the more time it takes the more time it takes that means the reason is because there's more information that's needed to get get and get over the line so potentially if there is risk around you know internal control um, issues then um, auditors will be looking at that again yeah. if that right. hasn't been closed off yet that's, and that that makes sense so um we'll probably go one more question um shri it's probably more of a statement uh, not a question but um um is noticed that it is noted that it's suggested that engagement with the value is early the valuation companies also have the same issues in hiring staff that are suitably qualified for financial reporting valuations and also staff willing to travel um I suppose it looks like a comment from a valuer, but um, um, whilst early engagement by council is great, please be aware that valuation companies have filled their book with long-term contracts for other types of work for the times of the year where financial reporting valuations are not usually undertaken. Um, councils and auditors need to understand the constraints and pressures the valuers are under, both with resourcing, other work and valuation programs for councils in other states. Um, and look, valid points, I suppose. So again, it's um, it's almost then that planning for the audit also needs to take into account, um, you know, mm -hmm. other external support needed and lead yeah. times, um, and potentially from the from the comment there, maybe um, you know, longer term contract arrangements um, that might be needed to engage with valuers for multiple years that might help yeah. lock in yeah. time Why frames. Not? Why not? Yeah. Well, QA have been the auditors for many years. I can't see why a valuer can't be a valuer for three years, you know. Um, lock them in early so that, you know, again, it's it's all about planning um, and, and being ready. Um, so whatever whatever is going to help councils do that better, oh. why not? Why not? Yeah, good good message, Shri. Um, so takeaway there, look, look at your procurement arrangements. Can you go to a multi-year contract? With a valuer that um, that does good work for you, and um, and then use that to then plan multiple year engagements and, and ensure that your your audit processes can incorporate that and your timeframes can be met. So, and look, can I, can I add one more? Can I add yeah, one sure. more to that, Michael? Again, if you're a neighbouring council um, and if you both councils are said they're valuing roads in the same year, why don't you get one valuer to come and help you both? So this person can travel to one community, get the work done, move to that community, get the work done back to their office to do the report for you you know so that way then you know you you'll also have um, be able to collaborate with each other and and try and get the best outcome from both or maybe multiple councils hmm. and look Sri, i think we've gone over time but we, we could even talk longer we've got more questions that we didn't get to but look i'd just like to thank you for your time and i know you're always available to the lgfp and, and and the sector in general. So, um, so thank you very much for your time, Shri. Really appreciated. Uh, but just in summary, just a quick wrap up. Um, resourcing is an issue for both councils and auditors. Negotiate your timeframes or seek resourcing support as required. Uh, audit is a project. Treat it such and plan accordingly. Regular communication through the audit is essential to minimise rework. A locking calendar is well in advance of site visits. Key staff are very busy. Um, and the, the QAO has introduced a LG education information sharing with staff and contract auditors, and that's going to be an ongoing initiative. And um, a couple of other summary items, uh, timing of internal audits can assist with the external audit process. So Shri, we didn't get to that question, but um, again, you can potentially rely on internal audits, um, outcomes with to uh, inform your external audits. And um, another question that we didn't get to was what the LGFP can do to help in this space. And again, we are looking at developing guidance papers and we have in recent years that members can rely on for their for their order processes. Uh, and we are currently um, about to finalize our landfill accounting papers, which will be then uh, hopefully finalized and distributed to members for end of financial year use. So.
So that's a summary wrap up. Um, Shree's details are on the screen. So as Shree mentioned, he's always um, available if you are um, as an escalation point if needed, but obviously you need to go through your process. So go through your, your own contract auditors first and um, but always Shree's happy to have a chat on any issues you might have. So um, thank you again, Shree. And just to wrap up everyone, thank you, Shree. Appreciate your time. And just upcoming events. Um, there's a service level budgeting webinar on Thursday, the 6th of June, where we're going to talk about finance professionals and what you can do in terms of that um, service level budgeting um, QR code on the screen. Finance professionals forum is coming on Friday, the 26th of July in Brisbane. That's been sent out to all members. However, the QR code is on the screen free for members, $110 for non-members and um, just lock your date in your calendar for the annual conference 19th to 22nd of November. So let's save that date. All right. Thank you, everyone. And um, have a great day. And thanks again to Shree. And we look forward to thank seeing you, you again soon. Thanks.